when you are doing an exam, when you are doing an exam, uh, at any given time, you should be able to calculate IP addresses. If, for instance, maybe you are uh, required, maybe to you are required maybe to subnet a network. So one of the reasons why I shared the subnetting video, which was an external URL from uh, YouTube, is because uh, as part of networking, this being a course that you are taking, you will be in a position to create a network. You should be in a position to divide that network into smaller networks when uh, need be. And you should also be in a position to be able to calculate uh, uh, or to be able to identify which subnet masks to, should be, what, not subnet masks, but which uh, IP addresses should be used in what particular subnet. So I'll just recap on uh, on what, what was uh, shared last time, that in an organization, there is need to network devices. And the reason why you end up networking devices is because you want to, you want to be able to share resources. And these resources are expensive resources. Like for example, you cannot buy a printer. You cannot buy a printer for every user in the organization. So in that particular case, you, you end up buying one large printer that can, uh, can process bulk uh, printing. And you, you, you thereafter ensure that all users within the organization are able to access that printer and uh, use it. So the other thing is, uh, okay, or the other example is a server. For example, uh, in an organization, users will be using their own uh, individual laptops, either the provided by the organization, or maybe the uh, organization could be supporting a policy called uh, bring your own. So those devices are limited in terms of uh, processing power. They're also limited in terms of uh, storage, meaning that uh, if you had worked in a company for 10 years, you do not expect that uh, if you have been dealing with large files, at some point you are going to run out of storage. Again, some of these devices can be stolen. Maybe you have a laptop that has been stolen on your way to work or home, or maybe you left it in the car, and they are, you are likely to lose organization data. So organizations might not want to risk the information by having each user storing corporate data in their own devices. So they might come up with a solution, something like a file server. So a file server will uh, will be like a central point where all resources are going to be shared in the organization and everyone will be able to access uh, whatever files they want. Because look at this scenario also, that if I have a file that is shared on my laptop and I happen to go for lunch, uh, what will happen is that if someone needed to access a file that is shared in my machine and I went for lunch, I had maybe to switch off my machine. So there's a, a, a problem probability that work is going to stall in that organization because they are waiting for me to resume because they these are five they'd want to access from my device so such 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 arrangements are not efficient they are not beneficial to an organization and therefore an organization might want to provide a solution like having a file server where it's a central location where everyone can access the network so now when we are when we're accessing uh when we're accessing this network where we are saying that we have a network and this network is providing shared resources like printers, scanning services, fax machines, file servers, and any other resource that can be shared in the organization. There is now an element of security that comes up. Because if you look at a scenario where you are having a network at a home, it's just your network. So meaning that a home network might not have many other devices, and therefore maybe security might not be a, a bigger issue. Now. Uh, in our today's topic, we are looking at how can you design and manage network security, and I say, and the reason why that that now becomes an issue in organizations is because an organization is going to have a very large network, many users. The users uh, will be doing different jobs, and they'll they'll be required to have different levels of access. So at a home, it's not the same as uh, when you're at home and uh, having an internet network or a computer network at home. Because at your at home, your device belongs to one single subnet. Yeah. So maybe if you have uh, access to maybe to a wireless network or a wired network at home, and you have like two three computers at home, uh, what will happen is that all those two three computers belong to they belong to one network. So that one network is what you're going to call one subnet. If you look at the subnetting uh, example in the previous uh, session, uh, the previous lesson. 
uh, the idea of subnetting a network is uh, a way of dividing your large network into smaller networks. And why would you want to do that? Uh, one, one of the major reasons is uh, you want to manage traffic because uh, when, when users increase in an organization, usually you'll hear companies giving you stories of uh, how they started. They Maybe they started with one, two, three employees and how they have grown maybe into hundreds of employees in the same organization, the same uh, building. So usually as the number of users increase, it means that you are employing more people because the organization is growing. But there's another problem that comes in. If they're accessing a network, the network tends to, to get exhausted. The network tends to be overloaded to the point where now communication through that network becomes extremely slow to the point where work in the organization cannot progress as expected. So organizations would want to find a solution around that. That yes, we are growing, so we'll keep on having more users and more employees in that organization, but we still want to be efficient. So they will look at that big network which was working and is and uh, was okay to everyone. And then the only challenge that they have is efficiency. So they would want to separate or to divide this network into smaller networks. So if an organization has departments such as a uh, human resource, maybe administration department, maybe things like uh, maybe marketing and such, they would want those departments to, to represent networks. So they do want a scenario where users of a particular department are sharing a network and that, that network might not be accessible to users who do not belong to that uh, network. So they are trying to segment traffic that there's usually a rule that is called the 80 20 rule. So the 80 20 rule means that 80% of your traffic, 80% uh, of your traffic comes from computers that belong to your department. So only the 20% is what you'll be accessing uh, computers externally, like maybe at one given time, maybe you'd want to access maybe the HR, uh, the HR network, you want to download a file there that concerns you as an employee, or probably you'd want maybe to access a computer that belongs to the finance department, simply because maybe it's the end of the month, and you'd want to access your payslip, and so on and so forth. But you'll find that a majority of uh, your network access will usually be within your network and accessing resources that are concerning your particular department. So now, uh, segmenting achieves two things. First, uh, if there was too much traffic because of so many devices in the network, when you divide your network into smaller networks, you achieve efficiency in terms of traffic, you're able to control traffic and you only give controlled access to maybe external resources. Uh, in these networks, it, if, if users maybe want to access external resources that like internet, uh, they would still be able to do that, but you'll find that the majority of their workload will be rotating around documents and uh, things that they are doing within their, their department because that's what they employed to do. But if you look at the home network, if you are, if you are looking at users at home, uh, the, amount, the, the idea of traffic or uh, increase of traffic is not a factor because uh, most of the time in a, in a modest family, the average number of people or devices in a, a, at a home environment would not be so many as to require maybe subnetting or segmenting your network into smaller networks. Now, uh, when you want, our today's topic is about managing, designing and managing network security. Now, security is a major concern to many organizations. And uh, the reason why it's a major concern is because there have been so many issues associated with security within the networks. For example, uh, companies have found themselves paying costly, maybe because of uh, leaking uh, or information about their private information leaking public and uh, companies for that. And uh, some of them have been forced to pay heavily in terms of uh, compensation. There's also the issue of uh, maybe reputation. If maybe some confidential information is leaked out of an organization, there's loss of confidentiality and uh, there's also something to do with the, the reputation of a company. So in an organization, it is important to build a secure network topology. And when you talk of a network topology, uh, you may have heard of that term before in other units. A network topology is uh, simply the layout of a network. Most of the time we refer to the physical 
the physical layout of a network or the arrangement of devices within a network. So it's important to build a secure network topology. And uh, because we are focusing on security, one type of a secure network topology is what we are going to call the DMZ. DMZ, that's an abbreviation for a term that is referred to as demilitarized zone. Demilitarized zone. So later on, I'll be sharing my content with you. But a DMZ is a layer. We can think of it like a layer of security between a company's internal network and the external network. So in an organization, when they have a network, this network is usually a private network. But at some point, devices within that private network network might also want to the external network you might have this uh, the organization has a private network but it also wants to to provide access to external uh, people for example like uh, let's look at a scenario where an organization wants to be known that it exists so this organization is going to to have a website that's just an example this organization would want to have a website so uh, where is that website so the website is probably hosted within the organization but now when you're providing access to your website because now that's going to be a public access that anyone in a cyber anyone with internet access is able to to get to a machine that is within your organization if you're providing that level of access because you want to be known or you're marketing your organization there's another challenge that comes up and that is the challenge of security. What if the sharing or the access, when you are giving access to this uh, particular server, what if there is another person out there who is interested in accessing the server and also trying to find out, apart from the website, what else is hosted within this particular server? Now, there's a possibility that in smaller organizations, the same server could also be providing many other services for example uh, it's possible to have a server that is a web server as well as this server being maybe a print server so users can print uh, maybe this server can also be maybe a file server where maybe organization users uh, that's where they store files uh, that are required most of the time uh, the shared files that are required by all users within an organization so you end up configuring this server to be a web server so what will happen is that you have given public access, but you might end up compromising security because maybe through that 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 machine, uh, it's it's possible maybe for organization data to leak out to the public, and that can have maybe adverse effects to an organization. Uh, I'll give you an example of an organization that I once worked for, where someone had access to a print server from the internet, and what they did was uh, they just wanted to prove a point that I can print from the internet. So what they did was uh, they sent a document to the printer. It was just a piece of, uh, it wasn't an important document. It was just a document to the printer. But they decided to print 20,000 pages. So the printer had uh, the printing papers. It was those, those large printers that could have like two, three trays. And each tray was full. So therefore, the printer was busy printing. The printer was busy printing uh, a document that was not important to the organization. But the whole idea was just to prove that it's possible uh, that it's possible to access your network from outside. So the organization was not able to identify who that person was, but there's that level of damage that they suffered or there's that, that level of um, inconvenience because you'd have now important, you'd have users within the organization that want to print important documents but the printer was busy printing some piece of garbage so that was just one example of a, a compromise to a network security so in an organization as much as you are trying to provide access to these shared resources you also have need to have security in mind and i've given an example that one way of uh, implementing a secure network topology is to implement what we are going to call a dmz so a DMZ we are saying is the militarized zone. 
So it's just an additional, uh, you can think of it like an additional layer of security, or you can think of it as a, a layer separating a company's internal network and the company's external network. So this DMZ provides public access to public resources. So there are those resources that when you're saying that one of the purpose of having a network is to share resources, and that's even a major purpose of having a network, there are those resources that you don't want to call public resources, and there are those resources that you don't want to call private resources. For example, access to a company's file server for internal use, maybe access to a company's printer is a private uh, resource, private to the company, which is shared by company employees. But you also have some other public resources that you want people to be able to access. An example is uh, like uh, access to your website. You want people to be able to access your website, maybe to download and some, some document there. If it's a school, you want people to download an application form to be able to fill. If maybe you want people to apply for a job, maybe you still want people to log into your site. They go to careers, they find the job that suits them and they make an application, it's submitted to your server. So in that particular case, uh, you do want that kind of uh, machine to be able to the public. You're saying that a scenario where at some point you want some devices to be accessed to the public. The best approach or the best topology that you can use is having what you're going to call a demilitarized zone. So it will provide public access to public resources. And by doing that, you're keeping the bad guys away from your network as well as providing services to your customer. So when you think of your customers, yeah, yeah for example, uh, job seekers could be your customers. And we also have scenarios where maybe uh, some external people or some people who have a relationship with the organization would want to maybe access something from within your company network. An example could be marketers. An organization could be having marketers that are always on the move. And these marketers at some point they would want to connect back to their company and the idea of that is maybe to access a document that is being required by a client out there so now when you have a dmz it is a perfect middle point for access to resources and anyone from the public network in this case the public network we are referring to as the internet will not have access to the company's internal network while trying to access these public resources so we have these resources that we are sharing with the public and we are calling them public resources. But anyone who is accessing those public resources might not use that as an opportunity to access the company's internal network because now there's a separation. And most of the time we achieve this by having what we are going to call a firewall that an organization wants access to internet. So they'll have maybe a router connecting them to the internet. Uh, through that router, they can access maybe servers like uh, web servers. That is if someone is accessing from outside. But in that particular network where they can access those uh, servers that are providing the public resources, those servers are not connected directly to an internal network. There could be another layer of separation, like a firewall, another firewall that is uh, separating the demilitarized zone or the DMZ network with the main corporate network, which you're going to call the internal network or sometimes you might end up calling it the intranet. So intranet is just an internal network. Most of the time, this network is the local area network. So we're saying that it's a perfect middle point for access to resources. So anyone from the public network will not have access to the internal network while accessing the resources. Now, a DMZ will help in creating a private network for your partners. So an organization cannot exist without partners. So I'm now looking at a scenario where uh, you do want maybe suppliers, suppliers to an organization to be able to maybe to log into a particular server and check the stock levels for the purpose of being able to, to replenish the stock. So that is one example. So there's a network that is called an extranet. So we have the internet, we have what we call the intranet, and we have the extranet. You should be able to distinguish the two or the three internet we are aware that is the public network it's a network of networks or an interconnection of many networks that belongs to different private organizations and then we have the intranet and intranet is a company's uh, private network that is only accessible within the organization and then we have now 
an extranet and an extranet is a uh, is just a version of the intranet that is uh, that is uh, improved we can say that it's a version of the internet that is given controlled access from outside and uh, suppliers or people who sell maybe items to an organization might be people interested in in accessing an, an, an organization's uh, extranet an extranet is just an intranet that has been given some selective access to the outside the point where a supplier can log in check stock levels uh, call the organization offer to deliver and there's that level of coordination i, I can also give you an example of uh, like let's look at a scenario where like uh, for example you can go to an agent you want to register a safaricom sim card so you'll find that you might not be able to register on your own but you might be able to go to an mpesa agent and this agent has been given some controlled access and maybe access to some uh, ussd codes that they can ask they are given permission to to require your id card and your details and they can register you to have now on behalf of safaricom network they can register you and after the registration is process is complete you now be a duly registered uh, sim card owner so it's just an example it doesn't mean the fact that you are able to be registered new sim cards it doesn't mean that they work for safaricom it doesn't mean that they have access to the internal safaricom network so what they have been given is just controlled access to resources that are shared with them and that is just one example of what an extranet can do so you can think of an extranet like a private dmz network because it requires what is called authentication when you're logging into this network it is not a network for everyone so you cannot call it a public network it is a it is a it is a network that is given selective access to members that are not part of the organization so when these members are logging in they will be required to be authenticated and being authenticated is just the process of being able to provide usernames and passwords so that is one way of uh, being able to access a network authentication you are trying to control who is accessing what network or what resource so at any given time or any time that they are accessing a public or a shared resource they will be required to be authenticated in large organizations uh, there is usually what is going to be called an active directory and an active directory is just a server a server that is uh, designed for authentication now if you go to an, any network and you are told that uh, this network has a domain or when you are logging on to the domain for example if you give if we use the example of a school network the computers in the school network will be joined to what you, is going to be called a domain and a domain is just a group of computers that belong to one network so there is one server that will be controlling those machines and this server is going to be called the active directory domain controller so an active directory means that this server is going to be it's going to be retaining an active database so it will be running a database of all the machines within within that particular network that before you start when you log into a machine any machine within that organization uh, if that username and password that you are using if it doesn't exist in the server then you are not allowed to log in so what is happening is that first the network must be there for you to log in and the other thing is that the server must be able to recognize that username and password that you are providing so that is a server it's an internal server that will be controlling the activities within an organization so now for an extranet it is just a similar scenario where there will be a directory service that is running that is controlling access and any users that are going to access this uh, particular network will have to be authenticated so authentication allows only authorized users to be able to access the network so that is an extranet it's just an intranet that has been given selective access to a few selected individuals who can connect from outside the company's network so you can be, you can get a better definition from uh, the internet on what an extranet is what an intranet is an intranet we have said that it is only available internally within a company network the reason why a company might want to have an intranet is to be able maybe to share important documents to be able to make maybe company announcements and any other thing that is related to 
the company. You can think of it like a platform. Actually, an intranet most of the time is something like a website, but a website that is uh, available internally within the, the organization. So only employees would have access to this particular network. And uh, it is uh, one, one thing that we have to, to note about an intranet is that it is not accessible from outside. So there's no external access. So there's it's only internal access. And in case someone from outside would want to access your company network, the only way, the only way that they can access that internal network is by having what is called VPN access. VPN access is a, an abbreviation for a virtual private network. So it's just a way that an admin, a network admin can configure selective access that your computer, your computer will usually be referred to as a client. So it can be given access to a company's internal network through what is called VPN. So VPN uses some protocols that are called the tunneling protocols. Tunneling protocols create a secure tunnel within the internet to ensure that any device or any machine on the internet might not be able to tell that there's an active communication going on. So there is some level of encryption between your device that is away from the organization and the internal company network. So we have protocols such as, uh, there's a protocol that is called the point to point tunneling protocol. There's a protocol that is called layer two tunneling protocol. So there are many other protocols that exist and they try to provide what you are going to call a VPN access. So VPN access means that if a user has been given access to a company's internal network, not all users will be able to do that. So there has to be some level of encryption between a device that is accessing an internal network and the internal network itself. The server has to authenticate the user anytime when they are trying to connect to the network. Now, when it comes to security, because our major or our topic of the day is about designing and managing network security, uh, one thing that has to be very clear to us is uh, what are the weaknesses? What are the weaknesses that companies find themselves in when they are trying to enforce or implement network security? Or what are the loopholes? What are the loopholes that would make maybe a company network to be compromised? And one major loophole is uh, the use of wireless technology. So if you go to many organizations nowadays, you will find that wireless, wireless networks are very, very popular. So there's what we call pervasive networking, meaning that they are common, they're becoming more and more common to organizations. And users find it very convenient to be able to use a wireless network because they don't have to be connected to cables. They can freely move around with their devices. But there are so many security concerns with regard to wireless networks. So as a network admin, because you're learning this course as a network admin, so as a network admin, you should be aware of the security loopholes that can come with an organization having an efficient wireless network. And uh, one thing that you need to have in mind is that you should try to build as much as possible. You should try to have a separate network for guests. And guests are people coming to the organization, visiting an organization, maybe to access maybe specific services. For example, if you go to any, like, uh, think of it like uh, you go to an airport, you go to a restaurant, most of the time they will have maybe a wireless network for users to access the internet. It is important as a network, as an organization, to build a separate network for the guests. The other thing is that in that particular network, so when you say a separate network for guests, it means that we should not have employees accessing this wireless network that is that is maybe reserved for guests. And the other thing is that we should not, we should not have uh, company internal resources being shared through that particular guest network. Again, this network should require authentication. And uh, when you're doing the authentication, you should try as much as possible to integrate with an existing name services. For example, uh, a DNS server, an organization that has a large number of users are likely to have a domain controller. So the machine you are calling uh, the Active Directory domain controller. And the other thing is that you should have what is going to be called a DNS server. And a DNS server is just a server that matches host names to IP addresses. So today, if you try to look for something on the internet, you do go and type google.com. Google.com is the name of a machine. But google.com is not, is not 
your machine is not going to use google.com to be able to access what you are searching for your machine is going to translate whatever you typed google.com into an ip address and that ip address is what will be used to locate that particular machine hosting that resource so it's important as much as possible try to integrate your wireless network with an existing naming services meaning that it will now be able to provide authentication to the devices that are logging into this wireless network so now in that guest network and we're saying a guest network is just a network for your clients who come they want access to the network and you should make sure that they are not accessing the internal network they are only accessing the guest network that provide them access maybe to the internet and will not have access to the company's internal network so one thing we need to know is that a guest network should be optional and an optional network is a network that is not part of the core network but it's very convenient for things like meetings demonstrations for example if uh, it's a marketing uh, you'd want maybe to, to to do a presentation you want to do a marketing presentation or it's a board meeting and people have to connect maybe to, uh, to to the internet to be able to make presentations to share to access something from their email so that is a network that should not to be part of the core network because the core internal network is a, a network that has access to maybe the most important files that a company works with and the internal operations the finances of a company and other records that the company might want to keep and that network should not be the same as the network that every visitor coming to the organization would want to use maybe to access their email or other resources on the internet so when you're creating a wireless network for clients you should ensure that it doesn't have access to the internal network but it has access to the external network because most of the time when people say i want to connect to your wi-fi network they are not connecting because they want to download a file from your computer most of the time they want to connect because they want to access the internet so when you are providing access to the public network you should try as much as possible to avoid uh, access to the internal network so because users are interested with the external network than the internal network and if they have to access both then one solution is for them to use different devices and the other solution is probably to be able to implement access control mechanisms so one 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 way that has been used to overcome uh, the weaknesses that come with the wireless networks is by use of what is going to be called a captive portal so nowadays there's a trend in wireless networking that anytime you are connected to a wireless network you will have what you're going to call a captive from the word captivate captive portal and the captive portal is used to avoid unauthorized use and it will only provide access to people who have been authenticated an example of a captive portal is uh i don't know if at any given time you have uh I have I have gone to a place where there is a there's a Wi-Fi network that is offered by Facebook. So there's a Facebook network that is called the Facebook Wi-Fi, and I've also seen uh, scenarios where uh, people supplying internet to homes. Anytime you see a, there's a wireless network, when you try to connect to that wireless network, uh, it's not the same as uh, how you just go to an organization and ask for the username and password and you authenticated and that's it. So you'd find that your device is connecting to that network because maybe it's supposed to be a public shared internet. So your device connects to that network, but to realize that you cannot browse, that anytime you need to browse, you'd be required to enter a username and a password. And the other thing with the captive portal is that the username and the password that you're going to provide is not a shared. It's not a shared username and password, meaning that each user, each user will have to be provided with their own username and password. Okay, most of those networks I've seen, they are networks where they even give you the prices, telling you that maybe pay 50 shillings, you'll have access maybe to 3 GB of uh, internet today, or maybe it's weekly, uh, daily, depending with the, the rates. And uh, as soon as uh, your subscription expires, uh, when you try to log in again tomorrow, you might not be able to use the same credentials you'd have again to be provided with a fresh username and password for you to be able to log in. So that's what we are calling a captive portal, where you are creating a scenario such that 
when users have a password, uh, they might not be able to log in because for each user, the username and password are different depending with the level of access control that has been given to those users. So we are saying that as much as organizations want maybe to, to create things like wireless networks, they should be aware of the risks that are posed with the, with, with the wireless networks. Uh, they should not just look at the convenience because most of the time, the reason why we create a wireless network is uh, for convenience. You might have so many users and your wired network would be stretched. And one way of extending your network would probably be providing a wireless network, which ensures that at least users can connect to their devices at their own time without requiring an admin to come and, and configure their their devices. So when you do that, ensure that you keep employees off the guest network. So employees should not be tempted to, to, to work or to do their normal, their usual company business using the guest network. It should be made, it should, it should be made very clear to the employees through company policies that when they're accessing this particular network or even the username and passwords could be different. If employees need access to wireless networks, you try as much as possible to ensure that these employees have their own separate wireless network that is connected to the internal uh, company network. And for guests, they have an external wireless network. So we also have this type of wireless network that is called an ad hoc network. And an ad hoc network is a network that does not have, a network that does not have an access point. So most of the time, this network will provide what you are going to call a point to point communication. So it is very common on mobile devices and most of the time it is used for sharing uh, things like maybe apps, maybe sharing small files, multimedia content. Now these networks, these ad hoc networks, so you can think of ad hoc as something that is more of a think random. Huh? A network that is easily created and, uh, and 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 it's a simple network to be able to configure and start using almost immediately. So these networks are difficult to control on managed devices. And uh, one way to be able to manage an ad hoc network is to make use of what you're going to call the mobile device manager. For example, a very good example of an ad hoc network is uh, in your phone device, in your mobile phone. You do want to create, uh, you do want to exchange files maybe between your device, your phone and uh, another phone. You want to share something with a friend or a colleague. You might end up using something like Bluetooth to be able to share files from one device to another. And of course, we have so many applications that people use to be able to share files. Yeah? For example, there's uh, Flash Share and uh, others that maybe you you know about that you are able to use to, to share files from one device to another so usually the the mode of connection is uh it's one way of uh, sharing files in a faster way but from an organization perspective it might present a lot of security challenges because these devices are not managed but your mobile device most of the time if you are trying maybe to create uh, that ad hoc network or even uh, if i use the example of you sharing internet with your friend uh, you'll create a wi-fi network and you try maybe to uh, you have created your device to be a portable Wi-Fi hotspot. So that is an example of an ad hoc network. So what you need to do is that when you're creating that portable Wi-Fi hotspot, you should be able to control the device. So I'm assuming that your gadget will have the ability to be able to see who are the users who are connected to your device and how you can block some of those users or how you can control access. But you realize that most of the time the username and password is the same for all users and that can bring some level of compromise if an organization was trying to use the same the same method of access. Now, one way of organizations trying to, to control uh, security or trying to monitor their security is by using something that can be called a honeypot. So when an organization is trying maybe to, an organization is trying to or an organization is trying maybe to find out whether uh, it's it's a it's it's a it's easier for maybe external people like hackers to be able to access their network. An organization might try to implement security by trying to create what is going to be called a honeypot. So a honeypot is a network that is attached to. You can think of it like a network attached system that is designed to be very attractive. It's a network that is designed to be very attractive to people 
like hackers and the whole idea of this is uh, an organization would want to find out whether there are people actively trying to maybe to hack to hack it uh its internal network so you can think of it as uh, maybe an admin you can think of it like uh, an admin in an organization trying to create a server that appears vulnerable and the whole idea of this is uh, just trying to see whether we have some bad guys that are trying to access the the network the internal network corporate infrastructure so an admin can create a honeypot. A honeypot will be one machine that appears to be compromised, but it's not part of uh, the core network. And the whole idea is just to see if this machine is not well secured, how easy is it for people to, to attack the machine and maybe steal information. So when you talk of the bad guys, you are not necessarily referring to people who are actively trying to hack your machine. You could also be having, uh, most of the time, uh, the bad guys will be other machines that are running some scripts in that particular network or running some automated processes that are malicious. So an organization creates a honeypot to be able to, to, to build what we are going to call intelligence. They are going to build intelligence of uh, what types of attacks exist in their network and what are the, the threat actors? What are the, the threats? Because when, when you look at, uh, when you look at implementing security in an organization huh? i think it's going to be a topic on its own so when you look at uh, how you can implement security there is uh, the process of what we can call uh, the risk management process where one thing is that you need to identify the threats because if you want to implement security you need to know you are securing your your device or your network from what so one thing is that you need to identify the threats if you identify the threats, the other question that you need to ask yourself is, uh, uh, what is the likelihood? Yeah, What is the probability that these the threats are going to be real? And the other thing that you're going to ask yourself is, if the threats are real, then uh, what is the impact to the organization? Is the impact high, low? And depending with the level of impact, you'll be able to come up with what you're going to call mitigation measures. And mitigation measures are just ways in which you can try to reduce the impact of this uh, risk because if the risks happen if the risks take place they become what you're going to call a disaster so a honeypot is just a network that can be set up that appears very attractive to, to the external people who might be having some malicious intentions in the organization but the whole idea is to see who are these people attacking what are the types of attack that commonly occur and the whole idea is just to analyze security and to be able to implement security measures that are going to take care of those particular threats so we have what is called a honeypot and we have what is called a honey net or a honey network so a honeypot could just be a simple a, a single system that the admin has tried to configure as a honeypot so the system is uh, is just a single system that appears vulnerable to attackers but it's able to capture real-time information about what activities are happening in your network now, an organization might tend to even create what you're going to call a, a honey network. And a honey network is just more than one honeypot on that network, which will have many sources of information. And the whole idea is just to be able to capture, to, be cap to capture the kind of attacks that can, can be occurring or would be frequently occurring in your network. So if you go to internet, there's a website that is called uh, www.projecthoneypot.org www.projecthoneypot.org will be able to get a lot of information about honeypots and uh, why they exist and how they can be configured in organizations now again uh, there's this uh, there's this there's this technology we we'll call it a technology or a method of accessing a external network that is usually used by many organizations and uh, we normally call it the network address translation so most organizations when trying to when they are trying to connect to the internet they will use what is going to be called the network address translation or maybe in cisco network it will be called nothing why do we use nothing or network address translation so one of the reasons that organizations will uh, will give for using NAT is that there is this statistic that it is estimated that there are over 20 billion devices connected to the internet so the world population is around 7.5, 7.8 billion people. Think 
billion people. That is the world population, 7.8 billion people. Uh, from these 7.8 billion people, these people own devices. Not all of them will own the devices, but you'll find that in addition to these people, because we are talking of physical people, we also have uh, in law, we have, we have uh, a person that you're going to call a natural person, and you also have what you are going to call an artificial person. So in addition to the 7.8 billion people, we also have other additional people, artificial people. And artificial people are companies because the companies, according to the law, they are registered in their own name. They are able to transact business using their own name and they are able to, to own assets and properties in their own name. So these companies will have networks and these networks would need access to the internet. So you can look at the population. If everyone was to be having a mobile device that is accessing internet, would have the 7.8 billion people having access to internet with their devices. And some of these people have more than one or two devices. Uh, and at the same time, we have, we have companies that can have or can own hundreds of uh, computers and devices that also require internet access. And according to the current trends also, we have what we call the internet of things, the IoT where you have now even very smaller gadgets, things like car tracking systems, maybe GPS locators, or even uh, fleet tracking system, or things like, uh, there, are many, there are many devices that can, can exist on the internet, that can, there are many devices that exist that require access to the internet. And these devices, most of the time, or any time a device is requiring access to the internet, must have an IP address. So now when you look at that, that they are over 20 billion, because you cannot physically, you cannot give an exact number that there are 20 billion devices. People keep on acquiring devices every day. There are over 20 billion devices that are connected to the internet and the numbers keep on growing. These devices require uh, an IP address to be able to access internet. But we have what is called IP address version 4. IP address version 4 supports up to 4.29 billion addresses so meaning that the available ip addresses are not more than 4.2 billion under ipv ipv4 because uh, at least you know what ipv4 is if you if you refer to the previous notes under ipv4 so we have fewer addresses so the address space is exhausted so using NAT, it is a method to conserve ip addresses to ensure that Several computers, if it's a company that has a thousand machines, this one internet so nothing is that te that technique where there is one machine that is connected to the public internet and all the other machines are able to use it as a gateway or as a method of accessing internet so, so that machine might be called that, that machine might be called the default Gateway. What was that?
So sorry, I lost my connection. So I'm going to repeat on what you are asking, but Ramona or nothing. And I'm saying nothing is a network address translation. And network address translation is a technique in which you can have one IP addresses being shared by by many other computers in a network. So if your company approaches an internet service provider and they want to access internet, so the ISP or that company, internet service provider, will only give one IP address. And this one IP address is what is going to be shared. It's what is going to be shared uh, by other devices on the network. For example, uh, anytime you find yourself maybe somewhere, even in a cyber, yeah, I can just give you an example of going to a cyber where you are going to have access to internet. And maybe you are able to check the IP address of your machine. You know, you can just type a command like uh, whatever. The command that you can use, IP config, IP config forward slash all. That is a, a command that you can type in CMD to be able to, to know what is your IP address. Probably your IP address is going to be 192.168.this.this. .this .this. But if you go to Google and try to type what is my IP address, what you are likely to see is uh, your public IP address and not the IP address that is running on your machine. So you might find that all the machines in an organization are running an IP address like they are starting with 170.16.2. something. Almost all of them in the network. But the actual IP address that they'll be using to access the internet is going to be a very different IP address. So the, the router, the router of an organization will be configured with the two interfaces. So we'll have the LAN interface. So the LAN interface is providing access to the internal network and we now have the one interface. So the one interface, the one interface is that side of the router that is connecting to the external network. So the one is just wide area network. So on the one interface on the router is going to be given a public IP address, but on the local area network interface, the LAN interface, the, that is the port, that is uh, the LAN port that is connecting your router and maybe the switch in the organization. Uh, there's, there's going to be a different IP address for that. And they might all be in the same in the same range because we have the LAN and we have the wide area network. So the process of traffic leaving your network, your internal network and going to the internet, goes through the router, which you are calling it the, the, the default gateway. So a gateway is just a point of exit from your network. So it will go through the router. Then the public address or the public IP address is what will be used to be able to access the external resource. So that is what you are calling the network address translation. That your internal addresses are removed when you are making a request, like you are opening a web page. Your machine will make a request using its own IP address. You are trying to get uh, some page. You are typing a, a website URL. So your machine has an IP address. So a machine requires an IP address to access a resource. But once, they, once that request gets to the default gateway, the router, the IP address of your machine is stripped, removed, and replaced with that of the public IP address because the public IP address is the only IP address that is allowed to access the external network. So that is what you are going to call nothing. So organizations tend to believe that that is a level of security, and which is a very bad idea. That... People use nothing as a method of conserving IP addresses, but it should not be used as a security mechanism because there is no protection. So most of the time, people believe that uh, the fact that you cannot see my company's internal IP address, so you think that it is a way of hiding my computer internally from the internal network, just because the IP address being used to access the resources, the external public IP address. So that is the idea that some organizations would have that nothing hides internal IP addresses and only the public IP address is what is used to access resources. So that is not a security mechanism and there is no protection that is offered by that. So the whole idea of nothing is just simply to be able to conserve IP addresses since they are few. So companies cannot be allocated so many IP addresses. They're only given one IP address and they find a method of accessing internet from their hundreds of computers using a simple IP address. And that is the main reason or the major reason why we need uh, to implement nothing. So if, if, if an organization believes that by hiding internal IP addresses is a way of implementing security, so that, that is a term in uh, computer security that is referred to as security through obscurity. Yeah. So it is a concept, security through obscurity. And security through obscurity is just the idea that, that if you can't see something, you can't attack it. So 
that might appear true in the theory, but you'll realize that hackers and uh, other malicious uh, scripts that will be running on the internet will have a way of circum circumventing nothing and to be able to even access, be able to access the internal network. For example, uh, uh, if you have been doing your CCNA once, I don't, I, I'm sure you have done CCNA one, two, three, and probably you're now doing CCNA four. You'll realize that at some point you have installed a program that is called Wireshark, and Wireshark is just a packet capture software. It is a tool that can be used to analyze the traffic in a in an organization, and it can also be used to capture traffic. If you use Wireshark properly, it's possible to even capture packets. For example, if communication is not encrypted or we have services like telnet that are running in the organization or services like uh, ftp wireshark is capable of capturing those passwords and being able to display them in clear text so meaning that the same way that nothing has been used as a way of uh, accessing an external network using one public ip address it is not a method of security and there is no protection that is offered with that and it's possible for the bad guys to circumvent NAT and also to be able to access information. So when that happens, because organizations will always use NAT to be able to access external uh, internet resources. But the only way that you can make your NAT to be effective is by combining it with the firewall software. So we have different types of firewalls. I would advise you to go to the internet and also try to do some research. What are the different types of uh, firewalls? So we have firewalls that are called stateful. We have stateful firewalls. We also have uh, we also have what is called uh, stateless firewalls and others. So I would advise you maybe to go to do your own research and find out what are the, what are the different types of firewalls and how do they work. So nothing should be combined with some some type of firewall for it to be able to to work effectively and to ensure that the organization is protected. And now, after through that firewall, you do not expect that maybe because an organization wanted to have access to internet. So not expect that uh, because now a web server is inside the firewall, that once you penetrate through the firewall, you can have access to the internal network. So we talked of something called a DMZ network, the militarized zone, that even when you go through that firewall, you're going to get to a network that is reserved for public access and there'll still be another firewall that is protecting the DMZ network and, and uh, the internal company network. Fine, I've, uh, Ibrahim, I've seen your, I've seen your, your concern, your, your question, that you want me to screen share how to use, uh, it's not Fireshark, yeah, you have corrected yourself, how to use Wireshark and how to navigate through it. So I think I'll, uh, I'll uh, I don't know because uh, I'm sure you are learning Cisco. And using Wireshark is uh, is a part of a topic in your Cisco networking, so I'm not sure whether you are able to refer to your to your Cisco notes. But in the case you need specific uh, specific instructions on how to access or how to use Wireshark, probably I will be able to do that with you in another session, not this one, because uh, I love to install Wireshark on my device and to be able to show you how to navigate through it. And uh, I have to prepare maybe something like a lesson plan on uh, what are we doing with the Wireshark? Are we trying to maybe like uh, analyze the traffic that is passing through? Which type of tra traffic are we accessing? Is it HTTP traffic that you want to analyze FTP or what services are running? So probably I would need maybe to configure something like FTP on my device for us to be able to see how I'm connecting to FTP and maybe how Wireshark is able to, to capture some of those packets that are, pa that, that are passing through the FTP traffic so what i want you to do for now because i want to terminate the lecture session it has gone beyond what is expected uh, most of the time these lectures are supposed to the live lectures are supposed to run for around 40 minutes we are almost going an hour uh, i'm going to terminate the session and i'm going to i'm going to post an activity in the forum what we expected to do so what i want you to do right now is uh if you do not have a packet tracer installed in your device I would want you to download and install a packet tracer in your device. Then, because we are building on the previous topic of IP addressing, I would want you to be able to create using packet tracer. Because if I ask you to create a network, you might not have access to three, four machines. But when you're having packet tracer, you might be able to create a switch 
uh, you can be able to create maybe like uh, four machines. So I want you to create a simple network. Have a switch. You do not even need a router in this particular activity. I want you to have a switch. Then uh, have like four computers connected to that switch. Then I want you to assign IP addresses and subnet masks to those particular computers. And then finally, I want you to be able to ping. I want to see like machine A is able to ping machine B. Because those are the basics. Most of the time when you are working in an organization, you'll be required to configure IP addresses and you should be able to test connectivity that two machines can see each other in the network. So that is a small activity that I want you to do. And once you are done with that, I would want you to screenshot that and uh, and upload. So I'm going to create I'm going to create a forum where maybe you can you can upload, or I'm going to put it like uh, just do it on your own. I do not want this to be like a cut or a quiz. Just do it on your own. Try to see whether two machines can communicate with each other. There is a switch connecting like four machines. Each machine has an IP address. And if possible, if you would want to access to, to assign an IP address to the switch, you might also be able to do that. That is if you want to manage that switch remotely. Most of the time, an IP address on the switch is not necessary. But if you need to, to manage that switch remotely, then most of the time you are going to configure it with an IP address so that you can you can use the program such as uh, uh, we have programs uh, such as Putty. It's a program that is called Putty that can be able to access using SSH to be able to access your switch and to see what is running in your switch when you want to configure it remotely. So that is uh, it for now. So unless maybe someone has a question, you can type on the public chat. I want to terminate the session. So anyone that has a question that they'd want to ask, you can type on the public chat before I terminate the session. Anyone? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to, to terminate, end the session. We'll go back to the forum. I'm going to post a discussion and kindly contribute to the discussion. I'll be, most of the time I go through the discussion forums and uh, you earn some marks. Yeah. For example, if, you are, if I'm required to award you up to you know that your cut is out of 15, cut 1, cut 2, out of uh, out of 15. We have assignments and other things. So when you put when, when you participate in the forum, it's one way of testing your understanding. And at the same time, you also earn some, some few marks. Because when it comes to exams, you might not be guaranteed. Exam is out of 60. Depending on the exam, it might be easier for you, might be a little bit tough. But most of the time, you earn maximum marks when you participate in the forums. And maybe when you respond to the small quizzes that are posted under each topic. So thank you once again. So you have a nice, a nice day ahead. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.